everyone and welcome to our service of worship for May the 30th. This is uh, sometimes called Trinity Sunday and um, so we'll be talking a little bit about what that means exactly. Please uh, join us for our friendship time on Sundays at 11:45. Um, it's a live Zoom call where we check in with each other and have some informal conversation and um, uh, everyone is most welcome to join us. The link goes out every Saturday. It's the same link every week. It goes out with the email um, that includes the link to the YouTube service. Please uh, check out our website for our announcements and events and news about KRU. And there's an email that goes out every Friday with the news of our community and uh, what's going on, news of council, um, suggestions for reflections through the week. And uh, as we look at some of these um, special months that have been ahead of us uh, over the last uh, six months, uh, Black History Month, Asian History Month, and then coming up in June, I think it's uh, Indigenous History Month. And so we're always trying to, um, to keep on top of some of the um, some of the things coming out of our national office and, uh, and in the world. Um, so call or email the church or visit our website for that information. The congregation of um, Kingston Road United Church wants to extend a really big congr congratulations to Alana Martin, who is um, minister to the GO Project and also uh, the person who's been working with our children and youth and CE committee for the past um, year and a little bit. And um, of course, many of you know that, uh, that Alana is my daughter, so I'm a little bit biased, but um, it's been a long journey for her. And to uh, this coming Sunday um, at three o'clock, she will be commissioned to diaconal ministry in a special uh, live service of celebration um, and that, again, that uh, link, if you wanted to watch that, that, that link went out in the, uh, in the email on Friday. And um, I am sad that uh, I'm not there with her. That was always the hope and, the, and uh, the intention was that I would be someone who would be, um, have the privilege of laying hands on her. But um, that was not to be. And, uh, but I know she's surrounded by, um, by a lot of love and a lot of friends. And, um, and we'll certainly be watching um, from afar. So, uh, but I know KRU uh, extends their, uh, their best wishes to Alana. And we look forward to working with Alana um, in the future as well, because she's done some great work. And that's just not me talking, that's um, the parents and the, uh, and the CE committee 
and um, and all of the work of the Go Project. There, uh, Amy uh, McClellan as well, who's a new staff person there. Um, that they all do great work with um, with our children and youth. I'll just take a minute to um, acknowledge the land. Toronto was in the dish with one spoon territory, and the dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace and friendship and respect. So let's just take a moment to prepare ourselves for worship. I like this candle as a symbol of the light of Christ in our midst, in and through the world, and in and through each one of us. Can you hear it? Can you hear the voice over the waters, breaking the cedars, shaking the wilderness? Can you hear the voice of God? May we be blessed as we worship today. Let us gather in God, weaver of starfields and atoms. Let us gather in Jesus, word of grace and resurrection. Let us gather in spirit, wisdom of creation and breath of life. For all our stories meet here in this moment. Each one held and loved by God, the three in one, the weaver, word, and wisdom. Let us pray. Spirit of love and life, we hear your whisper as the sun creeps over the horizon. May we listen for your voice. May we be attuned to hear your soothing tones as the moon and stars perfect their nightly display. God who speaks through the beauty of creation, May we, your creators, read the signs and follow your way, trusting that you will be revealed in our everyday lives, unfolding us to the mysteries of love. God of the universe, speak as we in creation listen. Amen. And now... We imagine that light and warmth from the light of Christ. We imagine that light that is in us and through us, and we imagine it spreading outward from us to those around us, to those in our community, to those around the world. seeing it spread like the rising sun as it expands into the world and the universe. And let this be our peace. And folks, the peace of Christ is with you. Amen. Our opening hymn is in more voices and it is number 42. Praise God for this holy ground. Praise God for this holy ground, place 
We open now to sacred mystery, to the Holy One, infinitely greater than words can express, whose love for us and all creation exceeds our capacity to imagine. Amen. This is the Psalm of David, Psalm 29. You divine beings, Give to God, give to God glory and power. Give to God the glory that God deserves. Bow down to God in holy splendor. God's voice is over the waters. The glorious God thunders. God is over the mighty waters. God's voice is strong. God's voice is majestic. God's voice breaks cedar trees. Yes, God shatters the cedars of Lebanon. God makes Lebanon jump around like a young bull, makes Syrian jump around like a young wild ox. God's voice unleashes fiery flames. God's voice shakes the wilderness. Yes, God shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. God's voice convulses the oaks, strips the forests bare, but in God's temple, everyone shouts glory. God sits enthroned over the floodwaters. God sits enthroned forever. Let God give strength to the people. Let God bless the people with peace. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. In the beginning time, I took a breath, and on my breath, supernovas and galaxies spilled into being. Light cascaded and life began. I am spirit, the inspiration. In the sharing time, I took bread and among the first of my followers, I broke it and shared the promise of heaven with them all. I am savior, the bread of life. In the ancient time, 
I took a bush and among the flames that never consumed, I announced my desire of liberty for those in captivity. I am creator, the freedom giver. In the renewing time, I took a community with tongues of fire and I called them into a new life and birthed the church. I am spirit, the energy. In the morning time, I took a stone and as dawn broke, rolled it and walked alive into resurrected life. I am savior, the alpha and omega. In a time yet to be, I take what you long to be and in those dreams plant seeds of hope and let them grow. I am creator, the hope bringer. I am spirit. I am savior. I am creator. We are Trinity. God's voice refuses to be pinned down, but weaves around us in beauty and majesty, in oceans of calm, in tempest and storm, lulling us into pausing, ensuring our rapt attention before compelling us to act in response to words of wisdom so beautifully spoken. Compelled to take up the cry for justice and sharing. Compelled to act until all God's children hear the voice of God as wonderfully loving and affirming and splendid as creation. When we think of the Trinity, sometimes we concentrate on the wrong words. We think that we have to try to follow the word Trinity with lots of other words. That will help explain what that word means. But it never works too well because the words we use aren't big enough. So we thought it would be a better idea to use words in front of the word Trinity rather than after the word Trinity. That might help us not so much understand, but to bring the Trinity to life a little more. What about the word um, awesome Trinity? Hmm. Or breathtaking Trinity. Perhaps the word mind blowing Trinity. Or even the word Magnificent. We thought these were pretty good words. Some said we had perhaps overused our thesauruses. But we needed a thesaurus to help us with words like extravagant, phenomenal, inconceivable. But when we thought about it, there were other words we might use. Like intimidating. Or frightening. Or even shocking. Because the Trinity is not always cozy. Like Moses on the mountain. Or Elijah in his cave. Or Isaiah at his calling. But we could also think of other modern words like unreal, wicked, ace, because Trinity is well up to date. Look at creation, always evolving. Or consider the church, always changing. 
or wonder about community, always finding new ways to engage. After a while, we realized that the words we used before Trinity were even more important than the words we used after Trinity. They have more expectation. More questions. More color. More wonder. So choose your own words. Be adventurous. Be interesting. Be unusual. Because if there's one thing we have found about the Trinity, is it's not always what you expect. It's not all sewn up. And not all the words have been used yet to describe it. Argumentative. Bizarre. Amazing. How would you describe what no one yet has been able to? One of the things that I've had to get used to since my longer than usual stay in Halifax this time around is the voice of Alexa in the house. As in, Alexa, add coffee to the coffee list. And then a voice answers, adding coffee to the coffee list. Or, Alexa, Play radio station WXYZ in New Orleans. And all of a sudden music starts. Sometimes she answers questions. 
mostly she knows the answers. And if she doesn't, she says, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Or I didn't understand that question. Can you ask it again? <laughs> it's all a bit unnerving. But after all these months, I've come to say I'm getting used to this. Uh, I have to say I'm getting used to this little round device that sits in the middle of the counter, takes direction, and occasionally even takes up a limited conversation. It would be easy for a time traveler, even from, let's say, 20 years ago, to think there was something supernatural going on. And in the... In the same way, it's hard from the perspective of today, today, 2021, to imagine a life without all the gadgets and technology. And I'm not just talking about the internet and the, and the mobile devices. It's only been a short time in civilization since we've had electricity, running water, the ability to communicate quickly around the world. And of course, there are still parts of the world and parts of this country even where not everyone has these amenities. Some it's by choice, others not so much. So imagine if you can living long ago when perhaps there was more a sense of the outside world and its awesomeness. One commentator I read this week said that many of the Psalms speak of the mighty acts of God through people, through great acts of liberation or salvation. Our Psalm today speaks of the mighty acts of God in nature, in creation. How the voice of God is heard in the natural world if we are listening. Where and how do you hear the voice of God? Where do you feel the divine breath? Liturgically, today is known as Trinity Sunday, and it refers to the theological doctrine of the Trinity. One God, known in the persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the only theological doctrine of, uh, sorry, it's the only theological doctrine that gets a specific Sunday of the year. There are few biblical references to the Trinity. However, some theologians suggest that the foundations of the doctrine of the Trinity are to be found in a pervasive pattern of divine activity throughout the Old Testament. The stories of how humans have experienced God through the ages. In the Hebrew scriptures, there are three major personifications of God, wisdom, which is active in creation and which is seen in the book of Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes. The word of God, which exists independently of God, which we see in Psalms and in the book of Isaiah. And the spirit of God, whose presence and power is felt within all creation. These scholars point to a pattern of divine activity in and through creation, where God is both imminent right here and transcendent out there. This is a dynamic understanding of God. And one theologian says that these scriptures bear witness to a God who demands to be understood in a Trinitarian manner. We saw some of that activity referenced in the reading that Alana and I did today. One commentary I read suggested that if we get too caught up in the semantics, in the logistics of trying to understand the Trinity, we miss the point. And the author says, I'm a dyed in the wool Trinitarian. The freedom it gives me is to relax when it comes to the doctrines and dogmas like the Trinity. When reading some of the ancient creeds and statements, he says that what is important is not assenting to the words as much as opening ourselves up to the experiences that they were trying to relate. I present the Holy Trinity as a theological playground, which has been passed on to us and in which we are invited to play, 
What are the ways in which you experience God? Many of you have probably seen the classic Celtic Trinity knots or triquetra, which comes from the Latin meaning three cornered, and they're found all over ancient stones and carvings, artwork, jewelry. There are many schools of thought when discussing the Celtic knot meaning, but all agree on a culmination of three parts. Early Christian understanding viewed the symbols as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A more pagan school of thought thinks thought sees the Trinity not as the drawing of the three inherent feminine powers, mother, crone, and maiden. A more met metaphysical understanding might think of the three corners representing body, mind, and spirit. And so on the screen here, you will see a classic icon of the Trinity by the Russian artist Andrei Rublev, done around 1411. And I also use the picture as the image for the front of the bulletin today. In the United Church of Canada, we're not that familiar with the use of icons. But as I understand icons, it's just another way to pray, to meditate, to experience God. As one gazes upon a particular icon, the symbols and colors can be doors to understanding, not just of the painting, but to God. It's a form of prayer and meditation. And so I wanna play now a 2016 video clip of the great theologian and author, Richard Rohr, talking about this icon. All religious language is metaphor. There is no other possible language for religion except it's like. <laughs> Once you hear that, you know that's true. But it's always shocking when I tell it to any crowd. I can see this stunned look on their face, particularly if they're evangelical or raised with biblical inerrancy, and don't recognize that words by their very function are all metaphorical. They're not reality. And that's why the word became flesh, <laughs> to become substantive so we could touch it and fall in love with it. So. I just, I change the prepositions depending on the day and how I'm praying. But God for us, the source out of which all flows, if you see in the classic Rublev icon, the Father is clothed in gold and his hands are joined in a sense of completeness, a sense of wholeness. So he's the source. The, the Son was called God alongside us because it, we Christians believe he became flesh by the mystery of incarnation and walked with us on the human journey. Now we're told that the reason Rublev uh, clothed him in blue is because blue being the color of the sea and the sky was considered the nature of the world. <laughs> the color. The color of the world is blue. Hmm? And red was that he agreed to suffer the suffering of the world in its becoming. So we call this, of course, the mystery of the cross. And the gold sash is how he, he turned the suffering into resurrection. Then, well, we have them gazing lovingly at one another. We have them both seated around one table, eating from a common bowl, as it were. And then we have the Spirit gazing down at what you might or might not see. But we now have evidence that this original icon still hangs in Moscow. And the recent scientists noticed there was something on the surface here. They scraped it off, put it under a microscope, and they said, it's glue. There was glue in this spot. Huh? If we took this little mylar 
uh, mirror off, you'd see there's a rectangle painted behind it. And the assumption of art scholars is there was once a mirror glued to this icon. So stay with me. The spirit is gesturing, notice his hand is gesturing down toward the mirror, pointing us or inviting us, you can take it either way, to take our place as the fourth person in the divine flow. This is what we would call our place, the body of Christ, if you will, don't be shocked, the second coming of Christ, this is the second coming of Christ. It's not Jesus returning except in a new form as the embodiment and the endless diversity that God has taken shape in. Isn't this good news? You'll do more than I've done. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Everything I have done you also can do and you will do even greater things. So many scriptures are going to make sense to you now, huh? But to think, and so this, this is my favorite icon. I've always had this hanging in my house and in my office. I think it's the most perfect work of Christian religious art. So the observer gazing here is meant to see himself sitting at the table inside the divine dance. Isn't that good? 14th century Russian mystic Andrei Rublev. They kill him? I, I don't think he was killed. No, I don't think so. This, by the way, for those of you who are biblically literate, it, the, the picture itself is the three visitors to Abraham. Remember, it describes them as men, as angels, as God. If you read the whole chapter, it's very interesting, the overlay of language. And so Christians came to see the three visitors who visited Abraham and he bows down before them and treats them as God, as a foretelling of the Trinity. You don't have to see it that way. It's not necessary, but to mystics, it was always very intriguing and very inviting. God for us, God alongside us, God within us. The divine dance, I love that. For those that want more, War has a book called The Divine Dance. In my theological wrestling over the years with the doctrine of the Trinity, I've most come to appreciate the fact that by accepting the Trinity, we accept a God that wants to be in community in relationship. Theologian Jürgen Moltmann says, remember the triune God is a social God, rich in, inter, in, rich in internal and external relationships. It is only from the perspective of the Trinitarian God that we can claim that God is love because love is never alone. I've looked at and prayed with the Rublev icon for over 20 years. And although I always knew about the theory of the fourth spot at the table, the spot for the observer to enter into the picture, I'd never heard about the mirror glued to the original icon. I found that fascinating. We are invited into the divine dance even especially in these hard, discombobulating, troubling times. Where do you hear God's voice? Where do you see God walking beside you? How do you feel God stirring within you? For we are all invited into the divine dance as we listen to Eric's meditative music, I will put up the icon so you can pray as you are comfortable, imagining yourself in the picture. 
may it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. We hold in prayer this week, Barbara Livesey, Keith Bolton, Sean Harvey, Bill Oxenham, Rob Williams, Cheryl Finn, Karen Hager, Owen Martin, and Randy Rohrbeck. Let us pray. God for us, God beside us, God within us. As we ponder the mystery that makes you three in one, may we be distracted by your love. May we be stopped in our tracks by the playful whisper of your spirit, rippling through lives, touching and caressing, healing and restoring. And in view of all this, may we be compelled to mirror the Trinity at work in the world around us, a world that needs to experience good models, a world that needs to see that offering service is not submissive, but powerful. God means so many things like creating and loving, and caring and speaking and listening and holding and hugging and forgiving, calling, healing, teaching, laughing, crying and renewing and sharing. A very small name that has a very big meaning. Open our minds and our souls to explore what you are to us and make an adventure out of believing always ready to discover something new about you and about each one of us together. And in the silence of our hearts, we name those that are in our hearts and minds today. We gather all these prayers in the name of the one who taught his community, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
May God's grace always enfold you. May Jesus' compassion always nourish you. And may the Spirit's imagination always find a home in you. And the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And as we blow out our candle, we see that the light changes as it too goes out into the world. Amen. Our closing hymn is in more voices. Number 176, Three Things I Promise. I follow so